Hello. Welcome to the Pirate History Podcast. My name is Matt. Thank you for listening. Lately, we've been discussing the pirates who were sailing out of New England, all of them with colonial authority on their way to Madagascar. That's the central drama of the Pirates of the Round, but that voyage to the Indian Ocean is going to take some time. So, while that voyage is underway, before they meet up with Henry Avery and before we return to that story, I'd like to pause our narrative for a moment. There are a few topics that I'd like to talk about. Some of them are just fun, but all of them are really worth examination. For example, today we're going to take a biographical look at the Admiral Benbow. Now, you may be thinking, when I say Admiral Benbow, of the inn in Treasure Island at which Jim Hawkins worked. Or you may be thinking of one of the real-world pubs that copied Robert Louis Stevenson's famous tavern. For our British friends, I understand there's a famous old folk song named Admiral Benbow, after the man in question today, but today we're going to look at the real Admiral Benbow. Vice Admiral John Benbow. Sir John Benbow was one of the most famous Royal Navy officers in the history of Britain. For the whole of the 18th century, a time that was enamored with maritime life, Benbow was a national hero. It was only when Admiral Nelson enjoyed his victory against Napoleon at Trafalgar that Admiral Benbow began to fade into the background. England had a new naval hero. But for our time, for the pirates who lived in it, Vice Admiral John Benbow was one of the most famous and certainly one of the most feared men in the world. This is episode 210, The Admiral Benbow. I could have introduced John Benbow earlier, and maybe I should have. Specifically, I thought about doing so during the action at Cop Barfleur, that large ship-of-the-line battle we talked about several weeks ago. Admiral Benbow was once thought to have been there, even leading the fleet, but that's not the case. He wasn't there. Instead, he was cleaning up his townhouse, which had been recently the home to a large delegation of Russian diplomats from the court of Peter the Great. And there are a lot of those kind of myths in the story of Admiral Benbow. But Historian Sam Willis challenges a lot of those traditionally accepted myths. And I'm going to be relying on his book, The Admiral Benbow, heavily today. Our John Benbow was probably born in 1650 or 1651. Much later on, when our John Benbow is a famous national hero, an astrologer would record his birth at the 10th of March, 1650, but... That's probably not accurate at all. John Benbow's mother's name was Martha. His father, we're not sure if it's Thomas or William Benbow, but the family, they were not nobility. Not even minor landed gentry, they were just middle-class up-and-comers, but they did well enough to send their young son John to get an education. And John Benbow was a member of that generation that saw that the single most promising career path for any aspiring young Englishman was the Navy. Oliver Cromwell purged the Navy back in 1650, and then, upon the Restoration, Charles II purged the Navy of all of Cromwell's men. The effect of this is that there was a vacuum in the higher ranks of the newly formed Royal Navy. Ranks that would have been filled at one time entirely by noble sons now, well, any man of merit could find himself in a position of power and even command in the Royal Navy. In fact, Samuel Pepys, who was a big believer in meritocracy, saw to it that, at one point, there were more common middle-class men in the officer corps of the Navy than noblemen, including some names that we know quite well. Most famously, there was John Narborough in that clique, but also a young man named Henry Avery and, naturally, Benbow. Those three names are memorable because all three served in the Mediterranean fleet, probably at one point at the same time and maybe 
even aboard the same ship. Now, I've typically kind of glossed over Henry Every's time in the Mediterranean because we don't know too much about that, but we do know quite a bit more about John Binbow's time, so we're going to take this opportunity to look at what was going on there. It was arguably the most important theater for the Royal Navy in the 1670s and 1680s, and it involved a ton of pirates. The Barbary pirates were a major threat for England in the years when the pirates of the round were children and young men. They were kind of a boogeyman to the English imagination. Mostly what they were doing was kidnapping and enslavement. They would capture ships that they found in their home waters sometimes, they would sail far afield, once as far as Ireland, and raid towns on shore. And they would take people prisoner, mostly women and children, but then they would return to the Ottoman world and sell them. It was in 1670, following the Second Anglo-Dutch War, that England finally had the power and the legroom to deal with the Barbary Corsairs. The Mediterranean fleet was a difficult, a dangerous posting, but promising position for anybody who was looking to advance up the ranks. First of all, you were going to fight if you were in the Mediterranean fleet. Depending on the peacetime or wartime status, you might fight the Dutch or the French, but you were absolutely going to fight the Ottomans and the Barbary pirates. You were going to fight big, ship-of-the-line battles and smaller running battles. You were going to engage in raiding and try to fight off raiding. It was a dangerous place to serve. And a lot of people died, but those who were good at their jobs, or at least lucky, had the opportunity to advance quickly. And that's another reason that so many of the men of the officer corps were not of the nobility. You know, well-dressed young fops who were given commands because of their name merely to pad their resume before returning to London, well, they rarely made it very long in the Mediterranean. A lot of these younger noble sons died, and then they had to be replaced by men of merit. Now, the Mediterranean fleet was under Rear Admiral Sir John Narborough. In 1675, Narborough led the attack on Tripoli. That was the engagement in which he sailed a massive force right up to the harbor and sent out a flotilla of fire ships. You know, maybe a dozen or so floating bombs that, when they struck their targets, erupted in flame. Within minutes, the harbor at Tripoli was burning. But here's the coup de grace. Immediately following the fire ships, in came a battalion of gunboats. There were sailors on board those Tripoli ships fighting the flames, but as they did so, when they were running around the deck with buckets of water, Narborough's gunboats opened fire on them. Now, those gunboats all had one big gun aboard, but really it was the smaller arms that were so effective. Not pistols and muskets, but swivel guns, early swivel guns, something very like an old harquebus, or maybe more like a blunderbuss. They worked kind of like shotguns. You know, there were small pellets of red-hot lead flying through the air at high speed through men that were trying to fight the flames aboard their ships. It was a... It was a brutal scene. Rear Admiral Narborough took the day with ease and forced Tripoli to sign an agreement of peace with England. And then he proceeded to repeat his performance at Tunis and secure an agreement from them. But then came Algiers. Algiers stood resolutely against the English fleet. Despite all of Narborough's best efforts, he was unable to take the city, for a couple of different reasons. First, they had an impressive fleet of their own. They had at least a couple of dozen ships, and not coastal skimmers here. We're talking about big, captured ships of the line, you know, 40 or 50 guns each. But that's just the Algerine fleet. There were also the pirates. You know, ever since the days of Hayreddin Barbarossa, Algiers had been a pirate haven. Some of them were Ottoman privateers, but... Many of them were European converts to Islam who were fighting a holy war against their former countrymen. But then, Narborough's attacks on Tripoli and Tunis made everything worse. There were a ton of smaller craft that called those harbors home, but 
when they returned and found that their home port had signed a treaty with England, they sailed for Algiers, so there was a very, very large contingent of Barbary pirates in Algiers in a really a state of siege. All of this means that Algiers was a nut that John Narborough just could not crack. So, in 1678, thanks to the end of the Third Anglo-Dutch War, the Lord High Admiral, James Stewart, decided to send reinforcements to the Mediterranean. A squadron of ships gathered at the Downs, but two, for our purposes, stand out. HMS Rupert was the flagship of the squadron, a 64-gun, 900-ton, third-rate ship of the line. That ship was no joke, and if it sounds familiar, it should. We've met her before. However, John Benbow was there as well, but he wasn't aboard the Rupert. Instead, when the fleet mustered at the Downs, he rode out to HMS Phoenix, a fourth-rate ship of the line. That's a ship that, later on, would be classified as one step above a frigate. That means that she had more guns, but wasn't quite as nimble as, say, the Fancy. Still, though, good enough for running battles. And the Phoenix should sound familiar as well. Both of these ships would play prominently in the life of Henry Every, as would many of the mariners who were here, mustering at the Downs. It's even possible that Henry Every was at the Downs in 1678 with this squadron. He would have been about 20 years old at the time, but his name doesn't appear on any of the rolls, but that's not uncommon. As for John Benbow and the Phoenix, they followed HMS Rupert south, in the company of a number of other ships. Benbow would serve as master's mate aboard the Phoenix. That's... I don't want to give away the game too early here, but that is the same rank that Henry Every would hold about a decade later. The Phoenix did encounter some resistance off the coast of Spain, though. As she rounded Cape St. Vincent, around which every ship that was headed for the Mediterranean had to travel, she found herself out of formation and fairly far from the rest of the fleet. And then a set of strange sails appeared on the horizon. The lookout spotted her and named her a Corsair of 34 guns and maybe as many as 400 men. When the ship came in close, she hosted the Sali Rouge and prepared to board the Phoenix, and then she fired a warning shot across her bow. It's a fine display if Phoenix were, as we can really only assume the pirates thought she was, a simple merchant vessel. But Phoenix was a warship. She responded to the warning shot with a full broadside. The Corsairs immediately realized their mistake, and they didn't want to tussle with a warship, so she turned to flee, but wouldn't you know it, at just that moment, alarmed to danger by the broadside, HMS Rupert arrived with the rest of the fleet and trapped the Corsair in between themselves and the Phoenix. There was nowhere left to run, however... Even if these pirates weren't looking for a fight, they didn't surrender. They fought back, and they fought hard. I'd like to read a passage from Admiral Benbow by Sam Willis. You know, we mentioned the Barbary pirate practice of taking captives for the purpose of slavery, and, of course, the English were happy to trade in slaves as well. Willis writes, quote, Whenever a naval ship and a corsair fought, the battle was ferocious. Today it is well known that corsairs enslaved those they captured, but it is often overlooked that the English reciprocated in kind. Herbert was under explicit orders from the Admiralty to sell as slaves those he captured, and regular shipments were sent from the English colony at Tangier to the great slave markets of Genoa, Livorno, Port Mahon, Alicante, Malacca, and Cadiz. And he goes on, we even know that in 1679, Herbert sold 243 Turks for the grand profit of 16,862 pieces of eight. At other times, he used them to barter for captured Christian slaves. End quote. Both the English and the Corsairs knew that slavery awaited them if they lost, so they were all willing to fight to the death. Nobody was going to surrender here. And that Corsair ship and her 34 guns 
did some serious damage to the fleet. Though she was surrounded and well outgunned, she almost fought off the Phoenix and the Rupert and another ship called the Mary. Nineteen men were killed on the Phoenix alone, with dozens more wounded. One man claimed that every sailor aboard took a wound in the fighting. You know, they lost hands and eyes and arms and legs. It's tempting to forget that our cultural image of a pirate with a peg leg and an eye patch and a hook hand, they all stem from life-altering wounds that usually are incurred on one of the worst days of your life, a day where in this case they were all fighting to avoid enslavement or to enslave their enemies. The situation on the Corsair ship, though, was much worse. Once the Rupert scored a hit on her mainmast and the English boarded her, they found that almost half her crew was already dead, or soon would be. At least, out of a crew of 400, they only took about 200 prisoners. And we have to assume that among the English there was a group of crewmen that had the unenviable job of dispatching those that were too wounded to sell at market. All of this is horrible, and the English at this moment really come off as villains, but we shouldn't forget that the Barbary pirates wanted to do exactly this to the men aboard the Phoenix. There are no good guys in this story. The Mediterranean was rough. And they weren't even in the Mediterranean yet. This was only two weeks into their voyage, but it was a taste of the kind of combat they could expect fighting on the Barbary coast. Still, though, only a few weeks later, the Rupert and her commander, Arthur Herbert, did reconnoiter with Admiral John Narborough, and Admiral Narborough handed him his orders. John Narborough was going to focus his attention on Algiers and the nearby shipping lanes. He was still trying to crack that nut. Herbert, on the other hand, was to lead his squadron to Tangier, the English colony there on the Barbary coast, and to guard their shipping lanes. There are a lot of battles in the coming years. Small engagements mostly, you know, two or three ships fighting at one time, but we're not going to talk about all of them. It would be impossible to do so. Tangier sits on the coast of North Africa, in Morocco. At the time, it wasn't under Ottoman control. It lies on the Atlantic end of the Strait of Gibraltar, not quite at the Pillars of Hercules, but guarding their approach. The strategic value is obvious, and people have always been there for that reason. You know, the local Berbers had their own settlement there. The Phoenicians from Carthage built a big city, and of course the Romans, and then the Vandals, and then finally the Umayyad Caliphate came in. Everyone wanted that port. At the dawn of the Age of Exploration, the Portuguese came in and conquered the city. But when Charles II married the Portuguese princess Catherine de Braganza, it fell to the English. We've mentioned all this before, but I want to illustrate what an important port it is in the Age of Sail. It guards the link between the Mediterranean and the rest of the world. And it's also pretty close to the port at Saleh. And those Sali rovers clashed frequently with Admiral Herbert and our story today. Now, in that first engagement, the one off the coast of Spain, John Benbow accounted himself pretty well. So well, in fact, that he earned a commendation from his captain and from Admiral Herbert. There was even some talk of giving him a position of command on board the Taken Prize, that Corsair ship, the Tiger. But that ship did not make it all the way to Tangier. There's some confusion because there was a different ship called the HMS Tiger in the Mediterranean fleet. But the Corsair vessel, it sunk. Instead, John Binbow was moved over to the Rupert to serve as master's mate under Admiral Herbert and it's possible that there was a fresh-faced young midshipman named Every climbing the ranks behind him. And I've got to tell you, I would love to go into life aboard the Rupert. It is a rich story, except for a few months where the logs were destroyed. We have excellent logs of life aboard that ship. It was, after all, one of the finest vessels in the Navy. And there's a ton of behind-the-scenes drama. For example, the carpenter on board the Rupert, a man named Bagwell, 
only got the position because Mrs. Bagwell agreed to sleep with Samuel Pepys. And not just the one time, she was something of a live-in mistress for Samuel Pepys, and she probably did so at the behest of her own husband. That's how important a position was on this ship. And Sam Willis really goes into great detail in all of this. It's a fun read, and I recommend it, but... Then this guy, Binbo, shows up on deck, a man who didn't bribe his way on board, a man who didn't pimp out his wife, a man who was here purely on merit. He proved himself in battle. He made a name for himself. All of these other mariners, they really must have hated that guy. But they didn't have long to do so. A few months later, Admiral Narborough was recalled to England, and that left Arthur Herbert in command of the entire Mediterranean fleet. Now, his squad did stay at Tangier, and most of Admiral Narborough's squad stayed at Algiers. But now Herbert was the big boss, and that being the case, there was a general shuffling of captains in the fleet. Anyone who was up for a promotion moved up the ladder. John Benbow was moved from master's mate aboard the flagship to sailing master of HMS Nunsuch. And that's a big promotion. The Nunsuch, though, it wasn't amazing. At least, not anymore. She was a 30-year-old fifth-rate ship of the line at this point, but despite her humble appearance, Nunsuch was... Well, she may not look like much, but she's got it where it counts. Now, a fifth-rate ship of the line that was built around this time would be called a frigate, but this 30-year-old fifth-rate ship of the line was what they called a fast ship of the line. Not quite a frigate, but almost. Kind of an experimental prototype for what a frigate would be. Not quite as fast, and carrying a few too many guns, but still not a bad ship. Now, the captain of Nunsuch was killed in action shortly after Benbow arrived. It's amazing that didn't happen earlier. These ships were in battle all the time. They were chasing pirates up and down the Atlantic coast of Africa, back and forth through the strait, and then they were bringing all of their winnings back to Tangier. Admiral Herbert promoted one of the men from another ship in the fleet to take command of the Nunsuch, and that is a name that we might remember we've met before. Francis Wheeler. He's the captain that would, later on in his career, bring Henry Avery along from ship to ship as kind of an indispensable part of his staff. It's likely, more than likely, that here Henry Avery and John Benbow served together aboard the Nunsuch, that they fought together and got to know each other, which will matter later on in our story. But today there's one last battle I'd like to talk about. It involves the ship Golden Horse of Algiers. The Golden Horse was the jewel of Algiers' already impressive navy. You might actually remember the Golden Horse. We've talked about her before. At this point she was under the command of Murat Raïs the Younger, another name that we've met before. He was Dutch originally, prior to his conversion to Islam, and was formerly known as Jan Jansun, one of the Sali rovers who rose to such prominence. The Golden Horse, though, was a constant thorn in the English Armada's side. She was capturing and sinking more than a few English vessels all throughout her career, especially under Jansun. The engagement in question today took place on 8 August 1681. Initially, this was a fight between the Golden Horse, under Murat Raïs, and Captain William Booth of HMS Adventure. The Adventure spotted the Golden Horse off the coast of Africa and, along with another accompanying English vessel, chased the Algerine ship down, but this was a bad idea. The chase took hours, as they usually did, but finally the English caught up to the horse and a battle ensued. And I'll give this to the captain, William Booth. It was brave to engage this golden horse of Algiers. It's likely they knew this ship and knew who commanded her, and Jan Jansun 
always gave a good fight, usually came out on top. And here, he gave such a good fight that that smaller English vessel, the accompanying ship, was forced to withdraw. By about noon, it was a fight only between the Golden Horse and the Adventure, and the Adventure at this point was losing. The battle went on for several more hours. They would fire broadsides at each other when they had the wind, they would try to gain an advantage, and occasionally one of the ships might even try to run, but it was a tough fight for everyone involved. They had both taken significant damage, and eventually, HMS Adventure scored a hit on the mast of the Golden Horse. Both ships pulled back from the fight. They were both in desperate need of repair. And they set about doing so, but this, as much as anything else that day, was a race. Whoever managed to repair their ship first would command the rest of this battle. And as it happened, the Golden Horse of Algiers repaired her damage much more quickly, and moved back in to attack the adventure. It was a bad situation for Captain Booth. Still, he rallied his men and prepared to fight, but then the situation got worse. Another set of sails appeared in the distance, and for a brief moment, both ships stood at standstill. They both waited to see who this new vessel belonged to. And as she closed in, the English were pretty sure they saw her flying a green flag. A green flag was a sign of the Barbary Corsairs ever since he read in Barbarossa. The Golden Horse fired off a single shot as a salute, or really more of a signal. And the newcomer, flying her green flag, fired two shots in answer. The proper answer. She was, indeed, a friendly ship. So... Yan Yansun, or Murat Rais, turned his attention back to HMS Adventure and closed in. He opened fire. The Englishmen aboard must have lost all hope, and it looks like some of them even tried to surrender. There were arguments aboard, and then the newcomer closed in, and it looked like they were doomed. But at that moment, they lowered their green flag and raised the flag of St. George. Suddenly, at the rail, there was a host of English mariners, and they fired off a massive broadside, point-blank range, right into the Golden Horse. And now they had the Golden Horse trapped in the crossfire, the worst position a ship could find herself in. At this point, the battle was, well, not quite over, but essentially it was done. The Golden Horse tried to put up a good fight, and many of them escaped, including, possibly, Yan Yansun, but they took the Golden Horse of Algiers. I find it interesting. Given the naval culture at the time, it was considered ungallant, ungentlemanly, generally un-English behavior to sail in a false flag operation, to sail in a time of war against an enemy flying a flag that was not that of the home country. It was something that every honorable captain observed. It's odd that the nunsuch would fly a Barbary Corsair flag. That is the tactic of a pirate, and I wonder if Henry Avery was indeed aboard if he gave them the suggestion, or perhaps learned it from his captain. However, in the aftermath of this battle, there was some argument over how to distribute the plunder. The nunsuch who had sailed in to save the day claimed that they were owed more of the treasure than the losing HMS Adventure. And the discussion grew heated, turned a little bit violent. No guns, but, you know, some roughhousing over who was going to get what share of the treasure. Eventually, they took the argument back to Tangier. There, before a representative of the governor, or perhaps before Admiral Herbert himself, they made their case, and in doing so, John Binbow made claims about the bravery, the fighting spirit, and the fighting skill of the men on board HMS Adventure. These comments were derogatory, even vicious. So much so that after the decision had been made to split the plunder more or less equally, John Binbow, among several other men from the Nunsuch, were court-martialed and removed from the Navy. They were fired. Which does beg the question, then why do we know him as the Admiral Binbow? Well, that story 
that's a story for another day. John Benbow is going to become the Admiral Benbow, and he is going to intersect with the story of the Pirates of the Round in very real, very consequential ways. In a way, he's the new Admiral Narborough, in that he's going to be something of an antagonist to the Pirates for years to come. Next time, though, we're not going to conclude his story. He'll be with us for some time. Instead, next time, we're going to talk about booze, hooch. We're going to talk about alcohol. I'd like to thank everybody for listening. I'd like to thank everybody that has helped to support the show. Everybody who has signed up to become a patron on Patreon, everybody who has left us ratings or reviews, and everybody who has recommended this show, you all make it possible. Thank you. Our theme music was, as always, The Old Captain by the fantastic band Brillig. If you haven't checked them out yet, you absolutely should do so. You can find them at brillig.com.au. That's B-R-I-L-L-I-G dot com dot A-U. After you're done over there, you can visit us at piratehistorypodcast.com, about which, keep your eyes and ears open. We have news in the works. But as always, and most importantly, thank you for listening.